Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. God is good, amen. I appreciate that. That message in song today. I'm also thankful today for for freedom that we have. Our, our story today is going to hit on a subject that maybe I'll spend a whole sermon talking about at some point. <clears throat> if you have your Bible today, Hebrews 11:11, 11, 11, it, it's a it's one of those verses that sometimes people skim over in this Hall of Fame of Faith we've been reading through. This is sermon number five in our series, Can I Get a Witness? And our witness today is Sarah. And, um, <clears throat> and in my version, my translation, it says, By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. She bore a child when she was past the age. We're going to talk about that. Because she judged him faithful who had promised, my wife said her translation said, by faith, even Sarah. <laughs> As though Paul's sort of just throwing a bone to Sarah. Oh yeah, Sarah too, she was faithful. We're going to look at this woman today, but there's some things you need to know about Sarah and her culture and the context. Um, I, I want to say this by way of beginning, that Sarah is an interesting character in Scripture. <clears throat> Many times the women in Scripture don't get a lot of press. And, um, and we'll talk about maybe reasons for that in a little while. But, but the wife of Abraham came from a slave-owning family. I, I don't say that to exaggerate a point or to shock you. I just state it as a matter of fact. <laughs> she was raised in a home in which her father owned other people. Uh, many of you who were raised below the Mason-Dixon line in this country have grandparents, great-grandparents, who were slave owners. They owned other people. And I know that makes you a little uncomfortable. Honestly, it makes me a little uncomfortable. I get that. But that's the truth of the matter. That's the fact of the matter. You, you can't change history by rewriting it or by taking down monuments, you might say that. I'm not going to get into that topic today. The sad reality is, is that Abraham's wife, Mary, owned, her family owned slaves. You say, wait a minute, Abraham's wife was Sarah. I'm talking about a different wife of Abraham. You see, Mary came from a slave-owning home. She was courted as a young lady by a man whose last name was Douglas, but she ended up marrying his political rival, a guy you probably have heard of. His name was Abraham Lincoln. That might strike you as a little odd that Mary Todd, who marries Abraham Lincoln, came from a slave-owning family, and Lincoln is the one that signs the Emancipation Proclamation. That doesn't end slavery, but it certainly pushes things that direction. It's the 13th Amendment that will ultimately destroy <coughs> slavery in this country. You might find that ironic, that, that Mary would marry Abraham Lincoln, who is opposed to slavery, at least the idea of slaves as property. You ought to read history sometimes, because Abraham Lincoln did never believe that blacks were equal to whites. I, I know you may have read that or thought of that in your high school history book. He didn't believe that. He, he never saw blacks and whites as equal. But he thought it was wrong that a man should own another man, that they should have equal opportunity to advance their life. And he saw slavery as repressing that idea. History is interesting when you read it unfiltered. <laughs> you need to let these people be who they were. Mary, I did some research this week. She was recounting what it was like, not just being married to Abraham Lincoln, but, but those last moments that she was with him. She was in the booth with him at Ford Theater watching the show. It was on Friday night, by the way. They were Sabbath breakers. They didn't know about that stuff. Contemporaries with Ellen White, by the way, she's alive and well during this time. But they, she was with him in that booth, as a good wife would be with her husband. There was also a couple, another couple in the booth with them, Miss Harris, who was a socialite. She was well known, well respected. She was actually being courted by another man in the booth, Henry Rathbone, and uh, she was recalling the last conversation she had with with her husband. They were holding hands. And for you, maybe that's 
no big deal. I see some of the wives in here cuddled up next to their husbands, and if I was sitting there, I'd be cuddled up next to my wife if someone else were speaking today. The, the reality was that in the context and the culture of those colonial days in America, public displays of affection were taboo, even husband and wife. And, and so she's holding her husband's hand. Here's a quote. Here's what she said. She said, what will Miss Harris think of my hanging on to you so? Lincoln's response was, she won't think anything about it. In other words, he's saying she can think what she wants to think. <laughs> it was just moments later that Abraham Lincoln was shot in the head from John Wilkes Booth. He, he dies from that head wound the next morning. Mary was a witness to that event. Well, probably one of the most well-known assassination events in this country. It's been talked about, been movies, been uh, all of that stuff. She was there. She saw it happen. Heard the gunshot. Watched John Wilkes Booth jump over that. She watched all that. She was a witness. Today, we're going to look at another witness. Another wife of a different Abraham. But she's number five in our witness list. So we're going to let her speak today. Let's pray. Father, uh, we're thankful today for time that you give us on the Sabbath to gather together with like believers. We pray, Lord, for our church, not just this group in Bonnerdale, but our world church. We've got challenges, Father, growth challenges, which is a good challenge to have. But I pray, Lord, that you would help us to find ways to reach people more efficiently, more effectively, and still maintain unity in our church. We pray, Lord, for our time together today as we look at this interesting woman, Sarah, on the list of the faithful. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to see her faith as a witness to us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. You have your Bible today? <clears throat> we're going to do what we've always done, what we've been doing in this series, I should say. And that is, we're going to look at the story from the beginning. If you have your Bible and you turn to Genesis chapter 15, we're going to start there because we need to know what what Paul is talking about here in Hebrews 11, 11. Some of you are familiar with the story, but maybe you'll learn some things today that you didn't know before or see some things you hadn't seen before. It's in Genesis 15, by the way, where we find God's second covenant with Abraham. Now, God makes three covenants with Abraham. And uh, the first one is in Genesis 12 where he calls him and he says, look, I need you to go. I'll show you where to go. We talked about that last time we were together. I'll, I'll show you where to go. And Abraham just packs up and goes. His faith is made evident in his suitcase. <laughs> he just goes. We find in Genesis 15, God addressing his servant again, Abram, and it says in Genesis 15, verse 1, we'll begin at the beginning. We're going to read our Bible some today, so I hope you have one with you. <clears throat> After these things, <clears throat> New King James Version, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? The heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, this one shall not be your heir but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And then he brought him outside and he said, look now towards the heavens and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord. That's what mine says in verse six. You say that? He believed the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. I, I, I want you to know this is a beautiful promise that is given to Abraham. He's, he's reassuring him, he's reminding him that he is with him, that he's for him, even in his old age, he hasn't forsaken him. And he makes him this promise that even though you don't have any kids right now, look at the stars. That's gonna be your heritage. It's an amazing promise. Even though Abram was old and Sarah was old and they'd been together for years and years and no doubt had tried for years and years and decades to have children, they had exactly acquired zero children. And all of the evidence, 
pointed to the sad reality that Abram and Sarah were never going to become parents. And in spite of all the <clears throat> evidence to the contrary, and his years and years of trying and attempting and failing, God gives him a promise, and Abram just believes it. Believe it. The term that's used, by the way, in Genesis 15, verse 6, where it says he accounted it to him, right? It's a bookkeeping term. Those of you treasurers and CPAs, the ones who like to do that sort of thing, I don't get it, but some people do. It's a bookkeeping term. What, well, what does that mean? Well, you ever balance a checkbook? I, a lot of people don't even have checkbooks anymore. It's a debit card, and you just hope at the end that it all ends up. You ought to balance your checkbook at some point. I know we're a cashless society or nearing to becoming a cashless society. But when you balance a checkbook, there's a debit column and a credit column. The credits are the good stuff. That's when you actually get a paycheck and put it in the bank. Or it's a automatically deposited probably today. And, and you actually have money in your account. The deductions are when you go to Walmart and the gas station and all that stuff. And your kid needs money. All that stuff. Okay, All that comes out of the debit column. As long as you've got more in the credit column than you do in the debit column, you're in the black, right? you got more debits than credits than you're in the red. That's why they call it Black Friday, by the way. Stores are in the red until Black Friday. Then they go into the black to actually make money, okay? So uh, what does all that mean? Well, it means this. <clears throat> Abram was, in terms of righteousness, in the red. He was deep in the red. In terms of righteousness. Well, it's Abraham. He's already gone. He's done what God asked him to do. Isn't he, isn't he righteous? My Bible says that uh, there is no one righteous. Not even one. Amen. That that actually each and every one of us on our own have a negative balance in terms of righteousness. In fact, it's an, it's an infinite amount of unrighteousness that we have. That's what we have. But I want you to see what happens in this one little verse. It's sort of pivotal here. It's going to give you a good understanding of righteousness by faith. Because it says that in verse 6 that he believed the Lord. And because of his belief, even, even though all the evidence suggested otherwise that God couldn't do, wouldn't do, it wouldn't happen, that he wouldn't become a father. All of his external evidence, his, his whole lifetime of experience up to that point, when God said it, he believed it. And because he believed it, God took Abraham's belief and he filled his debited righteousness account with righteousness all the way full. <laughs> he made him righteous. Before he does anything to earn it, God gives it to him. Do you see that? If Abraham had to do something and God said, because you've done this, you're righteous, that's righteousness by works. But Abraham just simply believes. And when he believes, God says, you're righteous because of your belief. It's righteousness by faith. Before he performs any good work physically, his faith was reckoned by God as righteousness. It's a beautiful thing. We need to remember that. I, I want to keep reading, though, Genesis chapter 16. We need to get to Sarah today. She's, she's the star of the day. And my Bible says, now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. We get that, right? No children. Um, and my Bible says, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. <clears throat> now, I want you to think about this for a minute. <clears throat> because Sarah, Sarai, Abram, Abraham, they are from where? Well, they're from Ur, the Chaldees. They're Chaldean. They come from Iraq, present-day Iraq, Babylon, that area. Okay? You remember what happens? The Lord calls them to go, and he starts heading north and east, Fertile Crescent. And he gets all the way up to Haran, and then in Haran he starts turning south, and he's heading by modern-day Syria, through Syria. He's heading down by Lebanon and all of that, Beirut. He, he heads down past uh, Israel, Jerusalem. There's a famine in the land. You remember what happened? We talked about this last week. He kept going south. Nile River Delta's down there. It's northeast Africa. It's a country called Egypt. Yeah, he goes to Egypt. Because of the famine. And he stays in Egypt for a while. Two or three, four, five, six years. We don't know. He's there for a while. And it's while they're in Egypt that they acquire some things. A bad reputation being one of them because he lied. But the other thing they acquire is slaves apparently. And one of those slaves belongs to Sarah. Okay? She is a slave owner. 
I know that may rub you wrong, and you may want to try to, you, you may like the word maid, maid servant or handmaid or whatever. It's slave. That's what she is, okay? By the way, I did a Google search this week. <clears throat> Don't do it right now. You can do it later. It, Google Sarah, Abram, and Hagar. Just Google that. Those three names, Abram, Sarah, Hagar. And, and they go to images on Google, and it's something really interesting. Um, what you'll find is that there's a lot of paintings, um, some from the Renaissance, some from a little before that, some from after that, that show there's a lot of paintings that include those three. And the painting essentially is Sarah giving Hagar to Abram. They're totally PG, okay? Or G, PG. <coughs> there's nothing, <coughs> anyway. So the, the thing that I noticed is that in like 95% of those paintings, pictures, the images that you'll find, 95% of them have Abram, Sarah, and Hagar as white folks. I mean, white, white folks. <laughs> um, like, like, Hagar is the whitest of them all. You'll, you'll see it. You Google it. You'll, you'll, I'm not lying to you. <clears throat> the reality is this. Abram and Sarah are not white folks. And, and I say that because a lot of the times Caucasians in this country, Anglos in this country, read our culture and our race into the Bible. We think Abraham, we think white guy. We think Jesus, we think white guy. We think Hagar, we think white girl. It's just not true. You need to know that Abraham looked more like Osama bin Laden than he did Bill Clinton. Okay? You gotta let him be who he was, okay? This handmaid Hagar is an African slave. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying this because when you read your Bible, you need to think. And when you think, you're going to add color to your Bible, pun intended. Okay? You, you need to have that. These folks were who they were. I, I've been in homes, <clears throat> and you look at paintings around here <clears throat> of Jesus, and you're going to see Jesus as a Caucasian. Uh, I've been in homes in Dominican Republic, and Jesus was straight up Dominican. <laughs> no doubt about it. Um, I've been in Asian homes, and Jesus is an Asian. Okay? Um, you got to let be, Jesus be who he was, okay? He wasn't a white guy. He was a man of color. These people are people of color, okay? They're living their life. They're, they're Bible heroes, okay? At some point, as a culture, as a white culture in the United States, you, you need to embrace that, okay? Let these people be who they were. So <clears throat> here's Sarah with her Egyptian slave, Okay, verse 2, Sarah says to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go to my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram said, No, you're my wife. The Lord gave me this promise. And is that what your Bible says? <laughs> now, it's not in there. <laughs> There's no debate here. There's no Abram saying, uh, no, I'm not going to do that, man of integrity. You don't see that, okay? My Bible says Abram heeded the voice of his wife. Okay? He said, okay. Sounds good to me. Um, verse 3, Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife after Abram had dwelt 20, 10 years in the land of Canaan. Uh, some people here want to accuse Sarah of weak faith. And I suppose that's one way of looking at it. I, I, I may offer a different... Look at that guy. I'm thirsty and he gave me a drink. <clears throat> I think it's that golden rod out there. Have you seen that stuff? That's everywhere. That tall stuff with the yellow stuff on the top? <clears throat> yeah, it gets me sometimes. <clears throat> at any rate, Abram was told that he would be the father of many. You, you can reread it again. We read it already once today. A, a, a child will come from you. What God doesn't tell Abram is who the woman is going to be. It's not there. In the, now it's assumed it's going to be his wife. Well, he marries Hagar. That's his wife. You see what's going on here? We're, we're trying to help God out. We're trying to help God fulfill a prophecy. It, it's interesting. And Abram was told he would be the father of many. Didn't tell him who the mother would be. Um, assumed it would be Sarah. But, but here Sarah and her husband are desperately wanting a child their entire life. They get a, a prophetic utterance from God through this vision that indeed he is going to have this son. And Abram believed 
And, and even though it didn't make any sense for him, he believed. And God said, you are a righteous man before me because you believe me. But Sarah was at the point in her life when biologically she wasn't able to have children. And she realizes in her mind, from her perspective, that what God has asked is impossible. There's no way it's going to happen. And so she says, if my husband is going to ever have this child to promise, it's not coming from me. Some people today struggle with infertility. I've talked to some couples. It's devastating to some couples, desperately wanting to have a child. They try and try and try. Modern medicine helps. Some of those couples, hormone therapy, there's artificial insemination, transplanting embryos, in vitro fertilization. And some of those who seek a child actually succeed in having a child through those methods. The success rate isn't great, frankly, and it is expensive. My insurance doesn't cover a lot of that. Some choose to have a surrogate mother. A surrogate is a woman who voluntarily allows an embryo from the couple to be implanted into her uterus that grows and develops, hopefully, into a healthy child. And then she gives that child to the couple. <clears throat> Sarah, in our story, is trying chiefly to do two things. She's trying to honor her husband. And she's trying to fulfill the prophecy. She wants God's promise to be true. She wants God to give Abram his son. And she realizes that she can't do it. What God is asking her is impossible. Uh, now, what we don't know is how much time elapses between chapter 15 and 16. We don't know how many years that was, how, how long they tried, how, how many years Abram and Sarah tried to produce the son of promise. And eventually, Sarah says, look, this isn't working. She's frustrated. Abram's frustrated. They're both frustrated. And what we don't see in the story is where Abram says, no, I'm not going to lie with your slave. We're going to keep on believing the Lord. Even though it doesn't make sense, we're going to keep trusting. We don't see that. There's no reassurance from him. Because you're my wife, we're going to wait. On we don't see any of that. What we do read is that Abram just lies with Hagar. He just does it. Because he and Sarah had both grown impatient, waiting for the Lord. I'll tell you, there's people today that are impatient, waiting on the Lord. There are Seventh-day Adventist Christians today. You know the biggest problem in the Adventist church today? It's not women's ordination issue. It's not transgender issue. It's not legalization of marijuana in college. It's, it, the, the biggest, it's not even our power structure hierarchy. In our, that's, that's, the biggest problem in the Adventist church today is that Jesus hasn't come yet. It's the biggest challenge we face as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Will we remain faithful and allow God to fulfill his promise? Hmm. Ever grown impatient, waiting for God to do something that he said he would do? Well, I think today, if anything, we've grown more impatient than Abram and Sarah, not less. This, this act of theirs, trying to manipulate circumstances to help God out, it shows us that even faithful followers of God who are considered righteous can find themselves not fully following God if enough time lapses. Faith that is strong can waver given enough time. I've known people, I've talked to some men and some women, they're 90 plus years of age that still believe that Jesus is going to fill his promise and return. Uh, some of them have told me, Pastor, I, I was hoping to see it in my lifetime. Now it's looking like I'm not going to get to see it, but I still believe that Jesus will return. Amen. Well, that takes faith. To believe something will happen even when you won't experience it in your lifetime. 
Abram is 86 years old. And he has a son. And, and they and, and things are messy. <laughs> I'm not going to read you the whole story. You should read it sometime. Sabbath afternoon is a good time to read your Bible, by the way. He has this son, and Sarah and Hagar are at odds with each other. Go figure. <laughs> Hagar thinks she's more important than Sarah because she's carrying the son of promise. Sarah gets frustrated. She goes to Abram, and Abram does the wisest thing he could do. He says, I ain't getting in the middle of that. <laughs> <clears throat> you do with her whatever you want to do with her. He steps back. Smart man. Things get messy when we try to change God's words to suit us instead of allowing God's words to change us. God intervenes, by the way. He, he humbles Hagar, makes some promises to her about her son. We're going to look at some of those in a minute. He, he reassures her that her son is going to be a great nation. By the way, <clears throat> Hagar's son Ishmael, you may or may not know, <laughs> is, um, is regarded as a direct ancestor to Muhammad of the Islamic faith. Without Ishmael today, we have no Islam today. We'll talk about that in a few minutes because that's a new <coughs> report for some people. You might note in Genesis chapter 16, verse 12. Are you there in Genesis chapter 16? I want you to see what God says about Ishmael. It seems like these prophecies are coming true today. Look what he says. Direct quote, New King James Version. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man. And every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Ishmael is born. It, Abram and Sarah's decision result in a divergence. Abram, <clears throat> for the next 13 years, is thinking something. And what he's thinking is that Ishmael is the son of promise. He thinks for the first 13 years of his son's life that he is the fulfillment of the promise of God. That he is the son of promise. That he is going to make Abraham father of nations. That Ishmael is the son. <laughs> it's not until Genesis Chapter 17, when Abram is 99 years old, his son is 13 years old, that Abram discovers that Ishmael is not the son of promise. I, I wrestled with that this week. Wow. It's huge. You know what the implications are? It means that even though you've been unfaithful to God, it can appear that God has blessed you and the external evidence of your unfaithfulness can suggest that God is blessing you. <laughs> it can appear as though I'm being blessed by God when I have not been blessed by God. Did you know that? Yeah. You look around today and you'll see people, some of whom live life in abundance, but they're not living consecrated lives. And some people would say God is really blessing them. It appears they're being blessed by God, but in reality, they're not. For 13 years, his son's a teenager. He's, he has loved him, cherished him, nurtured him, told him everything that a father wants to tell his son. He's shared with him his ancestry. All of those, everything he can do, he's empowering and equipping his son. He thinks he's going to be the son of promise, and then he finds out, He's not. Hmm. Genesis chapter 17, by the way, it's a beautiful covenant God makes with Abram. He changes his name to Abraham because he's going to be the father of nations. Going to be, he's not yet, is what God is telling him. You're not yet. And, and you get to verse 15, and my Bible says, God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her. And also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her. And she shall be mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. And Abram fell on his face. And laughed. 
He laughs. And he says in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who's 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who's 90 years old, bear a child? Are you kidding me? And Abram said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Just use Ishmael, Lord. Come on, he's good enough. And God said, no. Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son. And you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I've heard you. Behold, I've blessed him. I will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly. We're seeing that today, by the way. He shall beget 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Even though Abram laughs initially, probably out of irony, if anything else, we know that he believes God. And you know that when you read the chapter, because at 99 years of age, Abram is circumcised. He believes God, but what about Sarah? She's got a role to play in this, Genesis 18. Catch your Bible? The Lord shows up in Genesis 18. Abram receives him graciously. Skip down to verse 9. You'll find out it's the Lord here in a minute. I know it's more than one, but it's okay. Don't let that bother you. They said to him, verse 9, where's Sarah, your wife? And he said, here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And that means I'm going to make you fertile again. <laughs> and behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Verse 11, now Abram and Sarah were old, well advanced in years, in age. And Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, Alas, after I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abram, Why does Sarah laugh? Saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? You ought to underline that in your Bible at some point. Write it on a piece of paper, stick it to your refrigerator. Put it on the mirror in your bathroom. Put it on your cell phone as the screenshot so that you remember and remind yourself. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Therefore, Sarah, uh, uh, she, she laughs, and, and the Lord is saying, Is anything too hard? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah will have a son. But Sarah denied it. She said, I, I didn't laugh. Uh, she was afraid. And he said, No, you did laugh. Do you remember what they named this boy? <coughs> They named this son Isaac, and Isaac means laughter. <laughs> Abram's told he's going to have a son. He laughs. Sarah's told you're going to have a son. She laughs. God says, yeah, you're going to remember this. <laughs> We're going to call him laughter. We get to Genesis chapter 21. This is where things, the rubber meets the road, so to speak. Twenty-one, Genesis chapter 21, verse 1. It's fun to read your Bible in church, isn't it? Amen. Yeah. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived. And bore Abram, Abraham a son in his old age. At the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him. Whom Sarah had born to him. Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight years old as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh. And all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. Uh, some people think that the women in the Bible were repressed, uh, overlooked, relegated, pushed off to the side. And in some regards, that's true, culturally speaking. But I want you to see how special Sarah really is here. She's got insight, wisdom, boldness that, that we need to acknowledge today. It, 
in that same chapter in verse 8, just keep reading there, Genesis 21. Look what she says. It says, the child grew and was weaned. Abraham made a great feast on the same day Isaac was weaned. The, the reason they did that, by the way, is very typical. The weaning process is anywhere from a year and a half to five years. That may seem long to you, extensive. In many cultures, it's still like that today. It was a bonding time for mother and child. Um, the weaning day was a celebration because the infant mortality rate was very high. And when a child was weaned, it was a sign that they had passed that feeble stage of life, and now they were sturdy. Okay? And so there was a celebration to celebrate the deliverance from that feeble stage to the sturdy stage. Okay? So Sarah, at this feast, or maybe she had some wisdom before this, verse 9, she saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, scoffing. So she sees Ishmael scoffing at his half-brother. And therefore, she said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. Now, Abraham is hesitant. And, and, and you've got to let Abraham be who he was. She's telling him he needs to send away his firstborn. This boy that could have been as old as 18 years old, who he has raised, who he has invested time and energy in, who he loves. And he probably had feelings for Hagar too, mother of his child. And Sarah is saying, you can't be conflicted here. Isaac is the son of promise, not him. You need to focus all of your efforts on Isaac, not him. You can't, you can't keep him around and expect to be 100% devoted to to Isaac, you need to, he needs to go. And Abraham is wrestling with that. He, he, wants, he wants to keep Isaac around. And Sarah is saying, he's got to go. You, you got to focus on Isaac. You, you got to send Ishmael away. I want you to see what happens in verse 12. God said to Abraham, don't let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. Man, you ought to underline that. <laughs> For in Isaac your seed shall be called. Yet also make a nation of the bondwoman because he is your seed. God tells Abraham to do what his wife told him to do. I didn't say it, God said. She knew if Ishmael was around, Abraham would be all torn up, okay? As Isaac grows and gets his, Ishmael's going to feel second class. Is gonna, she doesn't want any of that. It's interesting. She knows that his emotions and his feelings are going to prevent him from fully trusting God and thinking rationally. Now, it's interesting today that some men think that women are the ones who can't think rationally, that they let emotions and feelings get in the way. And here it's Sarah that's acting rationally. And her husband is a hard, having a hard time not letting his emotions get in the way. <laughs> Sarah is a woman of faith. You might say, well, there was a lapse of faith there when she, you know, gave him her handmaiden. And I suppose that there was. But you need to realize the situation she was in. I'm not offering excuse. I'm offering perspective today. What she thought God was asking her to do was impossible. She thought that there was no way God could fulfill his promise through her. Impossible, she thought. When the Lord says that she's going to be the mother of nations, she laughs. Probably out of doubt in some regards. Probably because of irony. Now you're going to give me a child? Really? Really? After everything else, now. But when God gives his promise, Sarah has to believe it. Even though all evidence is to the contrary, 
And it's an impossible thing that God is saying. She believes it. Hebrews 11, 11, our text this morning. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. She bore a child past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. <laughs> I want you to know that God may call you to do something that you are fully convinced is impossible. He may call you to do something that you think is physically impossible for you. Biologically impossible for you. That there's no way. That scientific evidence, my own life experience is telling me that what God is asking me to do, I cannot do. And that's where faith begins. If God has promised... He who has promised is faithful Amen. to perform it. Amen. Maybe God has already asked you to do something impossible. And you have been hesitant. Because for you, it is impossible. I can tell you, when you put your faith in God's word, his word becomes reality. Yeah. Sarah's faith is made visible in Isaac, a bouncing baby boy. Incredible faith to believe that she would be able to have a son when science, doctors, medical, everybody else said there's no way. It wasn't a son vicariously produced through a slave. It was a son from her own womb in her old age. Her faith made visible in the form of the son of promise. And she becomes mother of nations. Amen. I wonder. How you show your faith. To people. Uh, we've been looking at. These witnesses. Each one. Showing their faith. By words. Actions. Deeds. Votes. All kinds of different ways. Sarah's faith is made evident in a son. I want you to remember this, ladies. With woman, it seems impossible. I, I, I say that and some men chuckle. You got that right. <laughs> you got a woman, it is impossible. It, the text is actually saying, and you know the text that I'm altering a bit. What it's saying is that when you try to make it happen in your own time, in your own way, it's impossible. <coughs> with woman, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Amen. All things are possible. <coughs> I don't know where you are today in your faith journey. Some of you, I can see your faith. I can see it. Because I see what you're doing for the cause of Christ. I see what you're doing in your church and in your community. I see what you're doing in your family. I can see it. I, I think other people can see it too. But if you're sitting here this morning and thinking, I wonder if people can see my faith. And if they could, would it be something they would praise the Lord about? Is my faith invisible because it doesn't exist? Or is my faith invisible because what God has asked me to do is impossible? I want to challenge you today to let your faith be known, be seen, be made manifest in whatever God is calling you to do. Do you trust that God is able to do the impossible? I believe that he is. Wouldn't it be an amazing thing if all of God's people lived their faith out loud? Amen. That people could see our faith. That they wouldn't have to question whether or not we were believers. They would know by looking at us, by observing us, by, by being around us Amen. that we were men and women of faith <coughs> without us even uttering a word. They would just know. 
I want to encourage you this morning. God is calling us. In, in these last days, I'm going to tell you, your faith is going to be tested. A, a faith untested may be no faith at all. We are living in a time where this church is not going to win any popularity contest. Will you be faithful until God fulfills his promise? I hope you will. I'm praying for you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we pause to thank you for your faithfulness to us. There have been many times, Lord, where our faith has faltered. Where we have said that we believe you and trust you and our actions and our words contradict that statement. We saw Abraham and Sarah today who believed you, they trusted you, and yet it seemed like you needed some help fulfilling your promise. We recognize today, Lord, that, that you don't need our help. You simply need us to trust you, to have faith in you, to have faith in your word. I pray, Lord, that we would, that we would be faithful to the word of God. Amen. That you would find us, Father, sharing love and grace and peace with other people, pointing them to you as the source of, of truth. So that they too can develop that same kind of faith. Amen. Help us, Father, to be able to do the impossible in your strength. Amen. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.